Beeline, 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 beeline. What's good? What's going on? It's me. It's me. It's Brian B. We back at it. And yes, it is Tuesday night. Listen, it's going to be a little weird for you guys seeing me on Tuesday um, with the guests that I have. Listen, I'm just going to get it out the way. Listen, I am honored to present the guest that we have with us today. There's a screen on the screen, and we're going to get to know this gentleman today. But listen, we're going to get to know him. We, we've been watching him our whole life. I know I can't even name the movies that he was in. I mean, it's been incredible. Um, you know, I can't believe that he came on with me today, but we're going to get to know him today. But you know, listen, if you haven't already, make sure that you guys like, share, subscribe, do all that stuff. You know, the YouTube stuff. Everybody knows what to do on YouTube now. It's been around for a thousand years. But um, listen, I, I, I can't even think. It's your boy, Brian B. And this is that show you watch on Tuesday nights, baby. The Beeline Web Show, where it's going down. And next we have an interview that you guys ain't ready for. Man. I don't think you're ready for it, but we're going to get to know somebody very special. But first off, let's just do it. Let's just get right into it. Let's go. Yes. Straight to the point, baby. It's going down in three, two, one. Brian B. Let's go. Back on the B line. I'm looking forward to it. I'm so excited. Use the influence you have. Again with Ranger. <laughs> you gotta be a clean baby's ass. <laughs> Hold on real quick. Knows <laughs> the hands of babe. People, people, it's your boy, Ryan B. Welcome to the Beeline Web Show. Let's go! Yes! Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Ah, oh, listen. All right, guys. Listen, listen. I'm very happy. First of all, happy holidays, man. Listen, we're jumping right into November. We're almost done with November already. How does this even happen? I don't even know. Like, like Thanksgiving is like next week. I've been, I've been looking all week, and all I see is Black Friday deals. It's not even... It's, today's Sunday. It's not even, it's not even Black Friday. <laughs> They have Black Friday all month long now. It's not even like a point of standing outside anymore. Um, but uh, listen, guys, I have somebody with me today. Listen, yo, listen, I I I'm so excited. Without further ado, I want to introduce a man that I grew up watching. You guys grew up watching. He's been in every movie that I can freaking remember. To literally, I mean, let let let's hit a couple of them. Home Alone, um, uh, 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 Money Talks, uh, Breaking Bad. I, I was watching. I was watching a TikTok. Uh, Mr. Hank and I was watching a TikTok the other day, and you were in the movie with Clint Eastwood. It was a prison break movie. It was. It was freaking awesome. It was. It was incredible. Ladies and gentlemen, I introduce to you on the line with your boy Brian B. Mr. Larry Hankin, y'all. Yes. Here talking with me today, Mr. Larry Hankin. How are you doing, sir? What's going on? Um, I'm not doing as well as the introduction, I'll tell you that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ready for it. <laughs> <laughs> Got to give you a grand you. opening, man. No problem. Much. It's an honor to have you on the show and talking with me today. But I'm um, definitely going to get to know him on this episode right here, and I'm very excited to speak with him. Like I said, I've been watching him. He's been in so many different uh, uh, movies that I grew up watching and, um, you know, different things like that. He's got some things to tell us, some new things he has going on as well. So without further ado, Mr. Larry, uh, how are you doing? You know, what's what's going on with you? I'm, I'm, doing, uh, I'm doing okay. Uh, just hanging in there, but, but, but fine. You know, I mean, it's, uh, the sun is out, so that's cool. I haven't been outside yet. Yeah, I'm doing OK. Yeah, doing okay. definitely, definitely, definitely a great time. You know, I saw something this morning. I got to get out the habit of I literally check my phone every time I wake up. But it's just like what I do at this point. And I saw somebody posted. He said, hey, I woke up today. So everything's good. And he, sometimes you forget about that because you've got so much going on in life. And you're like, you know, oh, man, I'm having a bad day. It's nine o'clock in the morning. Having a bad day. You just woke up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> at least you're up. You know what I mean? Like, you got you to gotta remember the small things every now and then. But um yeah, so so um I, I was introduced to you through somebody and um you know I, I can't believe like I said I'm having like you know a star of your caliber on my show to speak with you and get to know some things. Yeah, I'd like to talk to that point. Okay. Uh, I, I'm I do laundry. I I go to bed, I wake up, I breathe. So I don't understand fandom. I don't understand. I'm a person, and and you know, you give me a, a huge introduction, and it's really cool. 
I appreciate yeah. it. It's you, you like that kind of stuff. Yeah. But I don't understand it. I mean, like if I was going to introduce Clint Eastwood, I would just say Clint Eastwood. But uh, there's no avoiding the the hoopla of show business. It's show yeah. business. Very true. And I, I I can't get my head around it. <laughs> frankly, yeah. I I just don't understand. I mean, you see, because acting to me is how I pay the rent on my apartment, and so acting to me is a job. I, I'd rather have my apartment than my job. Yeah, I get, you know what I'm I saying. Definitely, I, I don't want to be homeless. Yeah. So yeah. the only thing I can do in this life is act. I mean, I've tried other things. I, I just can't do them. I, you know, I can't sit in a cubby hole. I can't. Uh, there's a lot of things I can't do. You know, I mean, yeah. even if I dig a ditch, it'd be slower than the next guy. I mean, it's just. So I'm in shows, and. So anyway, thank you for the introduction and, and this amazement. And yeah, I do know that a lot of people watch, have been watching me all their lives. Yeah, for real. But, Honestly. I mean, since kids. Yeah. Yeah, kids. I'm and now they're like kids, and man. they have their own children, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and you, you forget I, I about it. I can't wrap my head around it. I, yeah. I just, it's weird. It's uh, how, do you know anybody who's been watching you since then, kid? I wish, I wish, I wish, I just, hey, hey, guys, you good? Yeah, can, but, but it's, when, when it really happens to you, it's very weird. It's not yeah. like, wow. Well, I guess some people do go, wow, not, not me. I, uh, it's, it's very strange that grown men and women come up to me and say, my, I have been watching you since I was a kid and my children watch, have Honestly. been watching you, you know? Yep. That's, I have a son. Uh, that's heavy. Listen, that's Mr. Hank, I literally, I literally have my my son. My son came on the show and he comes yeah. on sometimes with me, and he watches, uh, uh, you know, he watches what I do and stuff like that. How old and is he? He's uh eleven. No, yeah, wow, well. eleven. Yeah, I, I think for a second, man, I'm, I'm maybe I'm getting older. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But, no, it's, um, it's like that. It's like that. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It is what I'm talking about. When when I showed when I showed my son your picture, he immediately um knew that you were from Home Alone. And, Holy and, and cow, man! At least one of like like you know, and he's just young. But we like I said, yeah. we we watch Home Alone every single year. Yeah, a lot of families do. Yeah, yeah, I love that it's a Christmas movie. That my favorite Christmas movie of all time. And um, you know, when I saw your picture, I, and like you just said, I didn't even think about it until you just said it. But I've literally been watching you and 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 these movies and stuff like that since I was little, man. Since I was yeah. a little kid, and like and I and I did just say this. Um, but I was on TikTok and I was watching, they've been having these things. The TikTok, you know, has these, uh, sometimes they'll play like parts and they'll show like different, like kind of parts. Oh, really? I, I, yeah. Okay. And commentate okay. on it. Yeah. And then, um, I saw you and you were in a movie. It was with Clint Eastwood. It was, uh, uh Escape from Alcatraz. There you go. That's what it was. And I didn't even know you were in that. And I didn't, I never saw it. I never personally saw oh, it. I it's a great it. movie. It's it a great, is a movie. great movie, man. I sat there and was watching the clip, and that's what made me um, 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 get into it. But um, it was such a good movie. When I saw you, I was like, Yo, you were so young. And I'm like, this guy yeah. has been acting forever, man. It's just crazy. Yeah. So um, you're gonna just, <laughs> I want to talk just, about that. <laughs> please, please. Uh, yeah. I was going to say, so how did you get into acting? Like, how, what was the start for you? I never wanted to be an actor. I, it's a mistake. This is all a mistake, man. Great mistake, man. It's a great mistake. <laughs> well, yeah, it turned out to be cool because I like it. Yeah. But it, uh, I only went to college because uh, my parents wanted me to go to college. I didn't even want to go to college. So they, they, you know, forced me. I mean, they didn't force me. It was my parents go to college. Ah, okay, you know, I was young. I was trying to be a good kid. Well, how old was I? Maybe 16, 17, I guess. I don't know. And then so I went to college, and I, so I chose, I thought, art. You know, because that's, that's my art there. So oh, I thought, okay. art. So, so industrial design. You know, I, I, I paint. That's awesome. So, uh, so I, I thought, well, industrial design. I saw the word design. So I thought that would be art, but it's not. It's engineering and math and calculus and and design and 
you know, like making a car. Yeah. You know? I mean, it's so I, it was a mistake. So that was a mistake, but I went five years. It's a five year course. Oh, okay. So I kept because I didn't know what else to do. So I just, well, I'll do this. I'm here. I'm, you know, and I was good. I was like a, an A student. And everybody wanted me to go design cars in Detroit. And I, I didn't want to even be in the college. So, yeah. but I just stuck with it. So when I, so on graduation night, two things happened. In Syracuse, at Syracuse. One is I got into it. I don't, I'm not. A, I'm not a fighter, man. Um, you know, I just I'm not good. So I, I'm not a fighter because I'm going to lose. I mean, I just I don't have that mindset of yeah. I'm going to drive this guy in, guy into the ground. I don't have that. So um, I got into a fight and I got I got the shit kicked out of me. But I mean, I started the fight, so I mean, it served me right. You said you started it. <laughs> Yeah, I started it. What what, what you do? Yeah. Oh, come on, come on. You gotta, gotta get some details. I just oh. cold cocked the guy. I mean, just oh, okay. just that's it. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, so he hit a, he hit a, a girlfriend of mine. He mm. hit her. Oh, gotta get hit for that. And I just went up to him and I asked him. I mean, I didn't see it. Somebody said, "Hey, he just you know hit uh, Joni." Yeah. But what? So I went over to him and I asked him very nicely. I said, "You know, hey, I I just heard it." You just hit Joni. Well, her name wasn't Joni. It was a Jane. Okay, so she, you hit Jane. And um, he said, yeah, I did. And I go, well, you, you, you can't go around hitting girls, man. You know, I was <laughs> trying to be... Uh, that was a cliche. I mean, yeah. in other words, I didn't even... It wasn't that I believed, which I do, that yeah. guys shouldn't hit anybody. <laughs> Okay, yeah, well, you shouldn't true. hit women. Okay, but that's not what I was saying to the guy. What I was saying was just by rote, you know, a habit. Yeah. Guys yeah. don't hit girls, so I thought I would say that to him because he was a guy and he hit a girl. So it was just like not an emotional thing. It was an intellectual decision. I get what you're saying. Yeah, I get. What I said saying. guys can't hit girls, and he said, "Look, I hit her. I, I, I saw her run out of crying." Uh, it was in a bar. I saw her run out of crying, and I didn't think anything of it. You know, people cry on time. It's not my business. Yeah. I was in another room. So, and he says, so if she comes back here, I'm going to hit her again. Wow. So I said, oh, okay. But, but the deal is, and this is all I wanted to know is, did you hit her? And he said, yes. And I said, okay, that's all I wanted to know. And then something in my head. This had nothing to do with me or in my body or in my autonomic nervous system. Just went, oh, that's all I wanted to know. Him. Mm. Just call cocked him. And it was a perfect shot. I mean, I'm not a fighter. I don't hit people. So if I'm going to hit you when I'm thinking about it, I'll probably miss or hit you on the chin or hit you on the head or hit you in the chest. Because right, right, right there, that takes... But it happened so fast, and I didn't even feel my. I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not a fighter, so I'm just asking around yeah. if anybody else went through this. That, what I felt was that. See that? Mm -hmm. That's switch. all I felt. Yeah. But what happened was a perfect shot. He went flying into the pinball machine and remember the guy said oh you just you know what is it yeah it knocked out my game or something it, uh, it, it, tilt it hit tilt you know he said, oh, it tilt. you know so he was mad now but luckily everybody in the bar said you know fight fight and everybody held him back and i thought wow and then the bartender said there's no fighting in here and i thought oh i just got away with it and then the bartender said, if they want to fight, throw them out. <laughs> the entire oh, crowd yeah. threw both of us out. And then we watched through the you know plate glass window out in the street as we fought in the rain. And he just, man, uh, if, if a buddy, if a Marine buddy of mine didn't come over and he had me down and he was <laughs> punching me, you know, knees on my arms. Yeah. I mean, how is it? I, this is the part I like. So he shouted in my face. You know, he's on knees on my, and, and he's looking down in my face like this. And he's saying, 
And when he looks at his knees, because it was raining, and his pants were all wet, the knees of his pants, because I'm on the sidewalk, his knees are on my arms on the sidewalk. And he points to my I'm on the ground, and he points to his knees, his pants, and he says, you're going to pay for the dry cleaning of my clothes also, he says. Oh, yeah. yeah. So I thought that, so now... Now it became, I'm a satirist. I'm a funny guy. Yeah. So I thought, what would be satire, which is humor with a gun or a knife? Verbally. Verbally. In other words, satire, you want to hurt somebody with a, with a zinger, right? Yeah, with yeah, a, yeah, yeah. Your mother's, uh, you know. That's what I'm talking about. I said, that's sad too. I said, what can I do if I'm going to die here right now? Because he's not stopping. I want to go out big. And he's in my face. So I just went, oh, I had a cold. I went, and I just spit in his face. Oh, man. He was that far away. Yeah. He was that far away. Well, I thought, you know, this is my, I'm going to die now. <laughs> And of course, yeah, I mean, he just got, his face just got, and he started, and all of a sudden, somebody picked him up by the, by the collar, by the back of the collar, and just, just like that, just yanked him up, you know, yeah. strung him around and says, it's over. <laughs> just like that. And he, he dug it, he, he got it, and he just walked away yeah. with, with, with a buddy. So that's kind of saved me, right? I was, uh, yeah. So I, that was the only time I've ever had a, a fight. So I, I've learned, don't go by cliches. Don't yes. go by, by yes. cliches, Larry. Yeah. You know, just because you're running the book somewhere doesn't mean you have to truly yeah. go out and be the, the policeman of the world. Yeah, that's very <laughs> that's a, true. That's very true. I think I think a lot of people need to really I've even said that a couple different times where it's like like you said, you just had that kind of mantra that was stuck in your head yeah. and you weren't wrong. You're not wrong no, about it. No, but I had nothing to do with exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So you can't I think one of the biggest problems we have with people as people as well, like is everybody's trying to be right everybody's trying to feel right everybody's trying to have an opinion of what they feel right is so if yeah. you do have a cliche that's something very easy to attach to to immediately present yourself as this is what's supposed to be i'm gonna <laughs> tell you supposed to be yeah <laughs> because you're not doing what is supposed to be done because this is what <laughs> you're supposed to say that's why everybody feels so entitled to give their opinion to everything, man. And and I think that's why we have a lot of disagreements, a lot of reasons why we can't come together in a lot of situations. Like, it's because everybody's too opinionated, man. And then you have cliches, and the cliches are stuck with you. You shouldn't hit yeah. women. You shouldn't say this. You shouldn't do this. But then when something happens where it may be a situation where you might have to kind of break one of those little laws that you have. You're looked at, you're frowned upon, but you're like, hey, listen, I know that this is a, a phrase. So you got to think of the, the uh, what is it called? The unintended consequences. Mm. In other words, I was right in hitting the guy. What I didn't consider, and they should teach this in school, is there's the cliche and there's the consequences of the yeah. cliche. In other words, that's one. It's not yeah. just... The cliche. If there's one thing, is the action, the word fit the word to the action. I mean, the, so the consequences. I wasn't ready for the consequences. You can hit somebody; they're going to hit yeah. you back. I mean, yeah. that, that, that's right normal. Right that's also yeah. normal. <laughs> you know, I mean, they may be carrying. <laughs> yeah, for real, man. That's, uh, you know, I mean, it's got to that. I mean, back in those days, no, I, I didn't have to worry about that. Today, you do have to worry about that. You really That's do. Weird, man. Yeah, it is. That's it's, weird. It sucks. it sucks a lot, but you really do, like you said. But that was a really interesting story. I mean, um, definitely, you know. Very interesting kind of, story, yeah. Kind of, yeah kind of, kind of, <laughs> I'll remember it. it <laughs> I bet you will. <laughs> I, 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 it puts you in places like that where you kind of, you know, that kind of makes you figure out about yourself, those situations like that. Like, you know, being in scary situations that maybe you didn't even think, you didn't know how you were going to react, you didn't know what was going to happen. Right, right, but yeah. when that situation happened and the guy was there, like you said, you kind of just instinctively 
hit him. Like it was just one of those things. I mean, it, it wasn't even a thought. I tell yeah. you, man. All I, yeah. all I, all I felt was that. But I mean, look, after it was all over, I tried to figure out what. What in me? Because uh, there was no consciousness to the act. But Larry, let me ask you something now. This is this what? is what's crazy. This is what's crazy. See how that happened to you, right? You had that instinctive, boom! I hit him, and then yeah. you got into the fight, and then, like you said, the consequence of the action was, oh damn, this guy's kicking my ass bad. I can't. What am I going to do now? <laughs> yeah, what am I going to do now? Yeah, but exactly. now if you got into another situation, and I'm just let's yeah. just say, like whenever yeah. you know, you got into another situation. Do you think you would still have that instinction to hit somebody? Because now you know the consequence. Yeah. You know um, what I'm saying? Like, that's what's Yeah, crazy. yeah. No, no. I, I, would, I would say I would still think that A, it was wrong. Yeah. Because that was a thought. I mean, I did think that. Uh, and I do, and I think that, that something should be done about it. Now, then you got to think about it. If something was going to be done about it, What's the unintended consequences? There you go. That's all. So you know, now that can take a tenth of a second to go through. Yeah, for to, real. To think that through. I mean, yeah. it's not like an hour. So you know, is there anything in the room here? You know, like I was in a bar at the bar at the bar, and she was in the back. There was a back room for dancing and uh, music. So I, I wasn't in the same room. I didn't see it. So I, 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 I should have gone to her and, and asked, did he really ask her, not him, because he's ready to hit anybody. Or oh, I to try to see if I can get another guy, or, or maybe if I was going to hit him, then think about, can I fight, can I take yeah. the punishment? That's emotions, man. Right, can, emotions. I, can I win this? Can I take it if I lose? Now, i got to tell you this. This is, this is not the end of the story. I tried to make, what do you call it, um, an ice cream cone out of a lemon or something? What You know, whatever, lemonade out of a lemon. And I, what I did was, I was fucked up for about, uh, okay, I'll tell you the whole story. It's going to be in my book. Okay. Uh, but I'm writing a book now. Yeah, I want to yeah, talk about story. it. For sure I want to talk about um, it. This is interesting right here. I love, love this. Um, the first thing I did was I limped. I mean, I, my arm was dislocated. And my face was fucked up. A cut over here. And I just, I, I could hardly walk. I walked home right to, back to the fraternity where I lived. No, I, I, was, it was, it was, I, was a, I was still in the freshman. I was a freshman at the time. Oh, so I, I went back to the, yes, I went back to the freshman dormitory, wherever. No, no, it was a sophomore because I had my own place. Sophomore. Okay. So I went back and I just laid down and tried to heal. You know, just try to, because, and it was getting late at night by now. And uh, so two things happened. One was I thought, holy cow, uh, my, my arm is fucked up. Um, and it's my, my left arm, and I'm a lefty. So if I was going to go to industrial design, uh, design cars, I can't, uh, you know, it's like an architect. I can't use my arm, I can't draw. Yeah. So there goes that for a little while anyway. So I said, as long as I can't now apply even, or, or, or what do you got, audition, apply, interview for jobs in uh, Detroit, um, I got to think of another thing to do. So that was kind of a good way to get, a, get out of industrial design. And now oh, I can't use my arm. There's a perfect excuse. Got it. And okay. the second thing was, as I was laying in bed, now this is around midnight from the fight that afternoon, um, I get a, a phone call, you know, the old landline phone call. Mm -hmm. I get a phone call. I, I, my roommate had to answer the phone because I couldn't even get out of bed. So he said, it's Joni. It's Jane. It's Jane. What does she want? She wants to talk to you. So I no, I can't. I can't, you know, man. Okay. She's no, she's really insistent. She wants to talk. And I go, oh man. So I get out of bed. I go, what? You know. And she says, I heard you got into a fight with her boyfriend. That was the whole thing. It was her boyfriend who hit. Oh, it was her boyfriend. Yeah. Got it. So he says, I heard you just got into a fight with my boyfriend. And I go, Well, yeah. And she says, I heard that you started it. Well, yeah, yeah, I did. Um 
And I didn't want to talk about it. I, didn't, I was too hurting too much. I just want to get off the phone and go back to bed. And she said, well, why don't you come over? So I said, well, you live in a sorority. It's after midnight. I can't go over. You know, there's law, there's, you know, law at Syracuse. You can't go. You know, it's after 10 o'clock. I think you couldn't have guests. She said, no, we can sneak you in. Uh, we do it all the time. I said, you do? She said, oh, yeah. You know, boyfriend. She's, like, she's, like, she's like a real trooper. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So she says, come on over, really, please. I got I got I got to see this. I want to see you. Uh, you know what what he did. Yeah, yeah. So I thought, well, I mean, I really liked her, but she had a boyfriend, so I mean, I, yeah, I just would hang around with her. So I said, okay. You know, I mean, I didn't say it that way. I did, oh, okay. <laughs> so I limped over. It was only 4 blocks away. I limped down there. And sure enough, she was waiting outside and we actually, and, I, and it's a great way that they did it. I come in the back. She, they, they, there's two two girls who are waiting for me. So uh, at the back door, I had to go in the back door. So what they do is one was her. Jane stayed with me. And then the other girl would go ahead about 20 feet. Then she'd wave, 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 wave us. Then when we go there, then she'd go ahead. You know, it's just like in the Army. You know, you yeah, got to yeah, scout. Yeah, yeah. yeah so they, she'd scout up. 20 feet ahead, scout up the stairs. We'd go up, scout down to the hallway. She'd go. And then we got to her room, and then they opened the door and said, you got until 6 a.m. You know, and then they should, and then me and Jane went in the bedroom. And they closed the door. And then um, we made the beast with two backs for a couple of hours. Very carefully. Very carefully. But this was a dream come true. Yeah. Now, Who's the takeaway? And then at six o'clock, they knocked on the door. I bet you they were listening out in the hall. But they knocked on the door. I said, hey, you know, you got to leave. So I snuck down the same thing back down, and then I went home. And I felt a lot better. But here's my takeaway from the whole stuff. Be careful what you wish for, because you may get it. Yeah, yeah. I, I was wishing that I could sleep with Jane. <laughs> That's not a good way to get a wish come true. Yeah, yeah. That's... <laughs> so that's it. I mean, the, the second day is, you know, think before you hit anybody, man. Yeah, you know, yeah, unintended yeah, yeah. consequences. No, but the major thing I took away from the entire thing years later was be careful what you wish for you because you may get it. And because I punched that guy in the nose, I got into show business. That's, yeah. That's because when I... Well, I, I when I healed, I mean, my best friend in college, you know, uh, was uh, Carl Gottlieb. He was later to write Jaws, you know, and a lot of other movies in Hollywood. Yeah. Yeah. So he was my best friend in college. So this was graduation night. This was graduation day, right? So that's when the fight happened. That's when I was snuck into the girls' uh, uh, sorority. The next morning, uh, I was talking to Carl. And he's, I asked him, I said, well, what are you doing now? that?" Because he graduated at the same time. And I said, uh, what are you doing now that you're graduating? Now, he wanted to be a writer for his entire life. Yeah. So he said, I'm going to Hollywood. No, he said, I'm going to Greenwich Village and uh, work for a newspaper, and I want to be a writer. So that, he was going to. So I said, how would you like a, a roommate? You know, I, I, I can't drive, uh, you know, my, my arm. Uh, so, you know, can I be your roommate? So he said, okay, yeah. So I so he went and he got a job in a newspaper. He had a great he, he's a great interviewee and yeah. he has great recommendations. So he got a on a newspaper immediately. And I just uh, bust bars from 2 a.m. to 6 a.m. for about uh, a month, I think. Uh, and the, the reason that I stuck with it for even a month, because it was hard. And I was healing and I was doing fine. But it was a bar and grill, and I could uh, steal food because I wasn't making enough money to pay even my half of the rent. Man, so yeah, I, I would eat out of the refrigerator from two yeah. to six, you know. And uh, but then I finally, I, and I had my nights available for, until two a.m. to, you know, uh, what do you call closing time? You know, last call. So I was in Greenwich Village, so I would hang out in the coffee houses, and I'd say, hey, I'm funnier than that guy. You know, the uh, uh, open mic night, three minutes, you know, you can talk for three minutes, and then yeah. you get off. 
So I was doing that for a while I was, you know, before I would go to work, I, I would go up and do three minutes. Of, and it, and open mic nights audiences are really great because they know it's three minutes. They know it's just guys and girls trying to try out stuff to be a comedian. You know, it was, a, you know, Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday, slow nights. Yeah. You got three minutes. So they would, they would wait. They knew you're not going to be funny. You know, they're waiting for their friend to get up there. You had to bring friends, you know. That's a good point, so, yeah. So they, if they bring them, then I'm going to bring their friend. You know, so the entire audience, right, either they laugh because you were funny, or they just sat there and wait for you to finish. You know, very, very nice, very polite. They, you know, in the three minutes, they got three minutes, you know. That's interesting, yeah. You're and it was really cheap, you know, a cup of coffee. I didn't know that you uh that you did stand up. How long did you do that for? Oh, I was really I got good at it. I, mean, I don't yeah. I don't fuck around. If I want to do something, I'll get I'm into it. You know, there you go. Yeah, I get into yeah, it. You know, I I just I get crazy. So That's no, awesome. I I so, so well, I'll tell you the answer to that question is really very simple and very direct. I was in Greenwich Village and I had um, Greenwich Village is about. I would say five blocks square. That's okay. Greenwich Village. And in there, there's all the coffee houses and the open mic nights and the, a nightclub or two. It's, you know, it's like it's like 32nd Street for five blocks, you know, mini, mini yeah. hippie. But, you know, it's a very busy on the Saturdays and Sundays and Fridays. So I would, I would sign up. There was, must have been about 10 coffee houses in the five blocks. And I would start out at 8 o'clock and I'd sign up. In all of them, you don't have to sign up, and then they just go by the list. Yeah, so I'd, I'd sign up for like the third or fourth at the first one, and then you know, like fifth or sixth or seventh or eighth at the second one, ninth or tenth. Or and so I would finish my three minutes, go to the next one, wait to go on, finish my three minutes, wait to go on, finish my three minutes. So in one night, I could work out a three minute thing that was awful in the beginning, and by the end of the night, I'd have it polished. Because I would change it each three minutes. I would use the same three minutes. Yeah, that's really interesting. That's so, really interesting. Yeah. So so Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, 10, that's 30. So then the next night, I try another three minutes. The next night, I try another three minutes. So in one week, I could have a 30-minute hunk. And probably it wasn't really great all 30 minutes. So what? 20 minutes, 15 minutes, whatever it was at the end of the a week, I had like a, a good solid little hunk that was professionally yeah. polished, and you know you do that for I did I think I did that for for three months, and uh, a manager came in and said, "Hey man, you're really funny. You know how how would you like to go professional?" <laughs> I yeah. say, "Oh yeah, that's why we're all here. Yeah. You know, not to go professional to get representation. That's why everybody was in the village. All the all the stars now they're big stars now." You know, Bob Dylan and Peter, Paul, and Mary and uh, Phil Oaks and uh, just all, all, all the stars that were big in the 60s, but there's a lot that were 70s and 80s and 90s were, you know, just starting when I left. Yeah. And um, they wanted representation, not money, not fame. You just wanted representation to get out of the village. That's what you... That, to get out of the village, you needed representation. You didn't need big bucks. So I got representation, and he started booking me with, um, uh, who was, oh, Woody Allen. I was opening for Woody Allen. So that was Woody Allen's manager, who said, hey, you got a manager. So I didn't know who he was, but uh, he had me opening for Woody. So I, I was opening for the best. I mean, Woody Allen was killing in those days. Yeah. I don't know. It was like in the, in the 80s or 90s. Yeah. So I was up there for Woody. And then, and then I started to get into critical thinking humor, which is uh, Lenny Bruce, Richie Pryor, George mm. Carlin, uh, Bill Burr, um, oh, the new guys, uh, uh, Joe Coy. I used to, yeah. I don't know what he's doing now. He's getting kind of middle class. Yeah, he had, he had a special on Netflix not too long ago. Joe Coy had one. Um, Bill yeah, Bryan family. just came up with something. Yeah, yeah. I, those, that's my favorite like type of comedy, man. Louis yeah. C.K. and yeah, those guys. Yeah, Louis C.K. Yeah, yeah, man, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I was into that, but back in yeah. the day, man, cops would come and pull me off the stage, uh, like Lenny, oh. you know. Oh, really? 
Oh, oh, yeah. I mean, guys would come at me with beer bottles, man. You know, get the fuck off the stage. Yeah, Whoa. yeah, yeah. I mean, they didn't say fuck. They said, get off the stage and bring on the Kingston Trio. Yeah, I was opening for the Kingston Trio with Lenny Bruce material. No, well, with uh, Louis C.K. material. Wrong, Larry. You had to find out of, because I thought I was, well, even, even uh, Woody Allen's audience started to, because, you know, he would throw, but I would come on first. So yeah. in the beginning, when I was, yeah. you know, just trying to be funny, I would, I would, I wouldn't kill, but I, I would, I would be really funny, you know. And he would want me to open for him, you know, and then he would just yeah. take it to another level. But then, as I start to follow him around the country and stuff, no, I wouldn't get any laughs. Sometimes I, I, I wouldn't get much laughs. I'd get kind of laughs. And I went to my manager and I said, "Hey, you know what's going on?" He said. Well, Larry, you got to find your own audience now. I mean, Woody's Woody, Woody's audience is not your audience. You, you've you've lost them. Right. You got to find. Yeah, you're still funny, man, but not for his crowd. So that was another hill you got to climb. And uh, finally, he said, "I've never come out with the beer bottles." Now, the beer bottle guy was the one that killed. He started. It was a nightclub opening for the Kingston Tree. He started walking across the dance floor. It was, you know, nobody dancing. I was on. Yeah. So I saw that beer bottle in his hand, and, and he was a he was a starker man. He would. <laughs> so I, I got off the stage. I uh, they said, "Get out of the the the, the uh, bartender said, "Hey, get out there. You got ten more minutes." I said, "Did you see the guy coming with a beer bottle?" Yeah, yeah. yeah. He says, he saw him walk. Yeah, I saw that. I said, "Well, you talk to him." He said. Get back on the stage, the Kingston Trio doesn't come on for 10 more minutes. I said, I'm not going back on there until you get rid of him or talk to him or, or get rid of the beer bottle. And he said, either you get out there or you're fired. And I said, you can't fire me. I quit. Mm -hmm. Figuring he would say, okay, we'll wait. Yeah. And he said, okay, you quit. Get out of here. <laughs> so... I walked out and it's a fucking snowstorm outside. <laughs> so I had to come back in to use their phone to call a cab, which is very embarrassing. You know, I stalked out, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And then yeah. I, so, yeah. but anyway, that's what got me into show. That's what got me into acting because my, my manager said, why don't you join Second City audition, you know, because they're doing what Richie Pryor and Lenny is doing, but they own the theater. So, Cops can't touch you and no beer bottles, you know. Yeah. So that's what I did, and that's how I got into show business. So so it was one thing, you know, kind of like using one thing to make it a little better and then making yeah. it worse and then making it better and then making it worse and better. That's really listen, like like I said, I did not know um that you started off in uh stand up. And and it's really interesting that you said you opened for Woody Allen. And um I'm I'm thinking here because I I'm I'm a stand up, I mean a huge fan, man. Like I like like as I'm, I'm super shocked. I'm definitely going to be researching all your, your stand-up now because I want to hear it. I want to hear what you are doing. Well, there's, I don't think there's any record of me ever being uh, on stage as a stand-up comedian. I, oh, I don't know why. Uh, but but that's one of the reasons why also I had to leave. Uh, not because of me that I had to leave or anything. It's just that I really didn't understand show business. Got it. I just wanted to get on stage and be funny. Yeah, like, yeah. The fact that I was losing... Woody Allen's audience because my sense of humor was changing and I didn't realize that, that you got to find your own audience. Everybody in show business knows that. Every comedian, I, I didn't. Got so every, every time I changed to do something different to get away from the, the violence, I met more violence, but on another level for a different reason. Instead of thinking it through, all unintended consequences, instead of thinking, because everybody else knew, I'm a stand-up comedian because someday I want to be in movies. Yeah. Be funny in movies, like Jerry Lewis, like Woody Allen, you know, those kind of people. I thought it all the way through. I'm a stand-up comedian now, but I'm going to be in movies. I never, I thought I'm going to be a stand-up comedian the rest of my life. I like being on the stage, making people laugh. Yeah, but man. you can't stop there because audience changes. And if you're opening for another act, your audience has to be theirs. Because 
that's who you're opening for. Yeah, I used to hear um like interesting things like you know a lot of uh, opening comedians that would open that would open for acts like a lot of times they would have well I'm saying a lot of times but from what I heard there were a lot there were some comedians who would like intentfully choose someone who wasn't going to be maybe challenging to them so it wouldn't be somebody who they feel would kind of steal the stage from them. Well, see, that's great because they thought it through. I know, yeah. I just got on the stage and made people laugh, and if they didn't, I'd wonder why. I God. thought I was funny. <laughs> yeah, you know, I got duh. I mean, I just totally clueless, man. Yeah, but, but you, you didn't free. know. How would you? Well, I mean, you got up, but what thing you did, Larry, that you just told us all right now was you jumping on the stage doing them three minute sets. There's certain people that would be like, and me included, you. I'm gonna be honest. Until I hear a story like yours, I'd be like, oh, I'm a three minute thing. I want to try to do com com um, comedy. I'm gonna get on for three minutes, and then I'm gonna see what I did right. I'm gonna see what happens. I'm gonna police the room. Oh, I did this. I did okay. I made some people laugh. Okay, I'm good. You said no. I'm gonna do three minutes here, three minutes here, three minutes here, three minutes here, three minutes here. You attached yourself to it in a way where you were gonna get results, like. Like right. Nobody else. You know what I'm saying? So you need that hustle, man. You need that drive in order to accomplish something. That's why I'm talking to you, telling you, I've been watching you and my kids are watching you. That drive, it's what makes an individual to your caliber, bro. Like you, if you can. Well, but wait a minute. Yeah. Well, yeah. You have well, to wait, 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 it, man. You're, you're, you're right. And. And that's what's needed. That that's the key yeah. Yeah. is the drive. But but what do you attach that drive to? And what I attached my drive to was this joke or these three jokes that I got up on the stage and I thought I had some funny stuff. That's why I got up on the stage, not not just to be on the stage to talk to people. Yeah. But I said, I have three things that I think are funny. Let me get on the stage and try it out. So yeah. my drive, the, the engine of it, was the drive was to get a laugh from something I thought of. Okay. Woody's drive was, I want to make movies. How do I make movies? If I can get on the stage and make enough people laugh long enough, I can make it to Hollywood. Mm. The same drive, different goal. Yeah, for sure. I just wanted, my goal was small. I just wanted to get a laugh for this joke or these three jokes. Gotcha. And I went around to make these three jokes better. Yeah. So my mind was still small. My focus was like that, the jokes. Yeah. Movies was I'm going to make movies someday, and I think if I because I'm funny enough, I can do it through humor. Mm -hmm. and I'm going to make these three jokes really funny by tonight, by the end of tonight. Yeah, the drive is there, but think bit, bigger picture. Think Got bigger it. picture. Got it, man. Ooh, and it wasn't I didn't know. It was, this is going to be some motivational right now. I mean, yeah, it's, inspired, it's for me. Like... It's for me. It's <laughs> yeah. you know. I'm reading a book, but I got to learn. I, I wrote one book and I tried to sell it, and it was a it was a bitch, man. It really yeah. was I because imagine. I didn't know anything about the book business. I know about show business now, but not about, so it was starting all over again. So I thought, okay, wait a minute, let me do some research about how to get a book out there, not yeah. how to write a book. That's awesome. how to get a book out there, and so I stopped writing. And did some research, and I found out, yeah, a lot of good stuff that I would have left out or mi missed or didn't know what they were buying. For instance, did you know I never knew this? And it's a very simple fact that you should know if you're going to write a book. 80%, at least 80% of readers are women. No. Not that's going to influence how you think about right. writing a book. Exactly. Yep. Exactly. Or if you want to ignore it, then know that you're ignoring that, that you're writing for the 10%. Know that. Now, there's nothing wrong with writing for 10%. Yeah. You just got to know that. I didn't yeah. know that until I started doing research. Another thing is there's a bestseller wave. There are certain genres of books that come in and out, like in movies. Uh, horror movies, 
good. Write a horror movie. It's going to be sold. For a book, it's romance. If you want to write a book that's a bestseller, and women, write a romance novel. Again, if you want to write a bestseller, write a real book, not a fiction book. Fiction sells less than reality. Do it. I, I, so I wrote a memoir, not a biography. What's the difference? A memoir, you don't have to get a lawyer. A memoir is all through your own eyes only. If, if I say I talk to you today and I mention your name and I write about it, if it's a biography, then you can sue me. If it's a memoir, hey, it's my life and you happen to be in it. I don't have to get your permission to be in my life that I write about. But if it's a biography, then I can't say that John told me that Jane was hit by Betty. Then John can sue me and Jane can sue me. So is it because it's like a factual kind of um, dictation? Memory it? is totally factual. You have to have witnessed it. Got it. And then like, you can sue me. No, I didn't know that. That's research. So I gave I you... <laughs> Four things about writing a book that you should know before you even sit down to write it. Yeah. Is it, are you writing a romance? Are you writing for women? Um, uh, do you want to sell a lot of books or you want to sell it to just people who really like what you do? Got it. You know? So, and I didn't know that before I started writing my first book. Now I do and I know a lot more like who to send it to. You got to send it to people who sell the kind of book you wrote. That means you have to find the people who like yeah, yeah, the yeah. Re representatives who like the book that you wrote, because they also sell genres in a in book. They sell, there's a lot of people who just deal in romances for women. That's it. You go to their website, it's just women books all about romances. And another one is all about camping, outdoors. That's a, that's a, a, a genre, outdoors. So it's real and you're in it and only that kind of person sells outdoor books. Yeah. So if you go to the men's person, even though it's a great book, they're not I'm sorry, I don't want I don't don't even not send it. Thing. Yeah, not it doesn't, thing. It doesn't matter. I mean it's it's so fucking fine, finely cut. Uh that well and also what I discovered is research. I never did research, and that's the key to everything. Yeah. All the great I'm artists that, that you ever know, all the great artists that you ever know, writers, actors, painters, scientists, war washers, they all did research. Bitch diggers, they all did research. They, you know, what kind of soil, what kind of shovel, what, you know. Yeah. Is it a grave? Is it a pit? Is it yeah. a chasm? I've got you this know, uh... I got this thing that I'm doing now. I mean, raising kids is one of those things where like kind yeah. of like what you're saying now. Yeah. It, it opens you up to think differently than you ever thought because right. I, find, I right. find myself all the time correcting mistakes that I make just by correcting things that I see my kids doing that I don't want them to do. And I tell my son and my, and my daughter at this point, like everything matters, man. Everything that you do matters, no matter how small, no matter how, like, you know, how much you might not think it does. Everything matters. The way you pick something up, the way you put something down, every little stupid detail completely matters. And that's what you're saying now with, um, with how you do well, it. Can I, can I, can I make a comment? Sure. Sure. Okay. Uh, uh, the word matters. Everything counts. Count. It reveals you. It's, it's your body language. Okay. Yeah. But it everything doesn't have to matter because matter to me means it's important. I mean, picking up a pencil is not important, but it counts. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? See, I mean, I, you can't cut it too fine. Yeah, because yeah, yeah. You become, you become a control freak. Yeah. Hey, okay. Matters. That's it matters, a good you know. point. That's don't, a good don't point. Don't be a control freak. See, this is, this is the reason why the, the pencil is a perfect analogy because... Um, I have pencils laying around my house all the time. 
Aha! Uh, uh-huh. like, you, you just read my mind with that or whatever. I have pencils because my daughter, she goes and she picks up stuff. She likes to write on paper. And oh, it. oh, okay. Then it does matter. See? 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 See but that's, that's why. But you know, it's count. I yeah. because I don't know about your daughter. So yeah, no, no, you, you, you're you're control right. Free. No, that's right. That, that's it's, dangerous. That's why it's always... It's a, see, it's like... Unintended consequences, man. <laughs> It's like everything's merging into one. Like yeah, yeah. talked about so far, it, everything matters, man. Everything counts. Everything matters. Everything you have to, especially. I can understand you with show business, like your story of you know beginning. You didn't know what to do. Like you, you saw Woody Allen. He was thinking grandeur, and you were thinking, yeah. you know, and just like Joke. in, jokes. Yeah, like this is where I'm at right now. But it's so incredible because even though you both had, you know, different ways of thinking, you both were pushing forward. You both were doing something. You were in the car driving down the road, regardless if he was in a big ass van, bus, you know, tour bus, oh, yeah. you were in a bicycle. Y'all both were doing something to get to a destination. Down the road. Yeah. Made it, man. You know, it's like, you know, we're talking to you now. Like, you know, we're reading your biography now. We're reading your, your memoirs. You know, it's, it's just incredible to know that. If you put yourself in a position to care, to to try to research, to try to do there it, there you go. Care, care. You have to fucking. You have to care, man. It's super important to get things done efficiently, to get things done at all. At, at the end of the day, because things are going to be challenging, things are going to be hard, and as soon as you hit a brick in the road, you can either stop or you can say, "Ah, oh, that doesn't phase me." Figure out how to get through it and continue forward, man. I think a lot of people kind of are able to let go and not really deal with struggle because it's easier to be, uh, 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 it's easier to like stop doing something now because everybody's in a place of, of complacent complacency. Like you, you, you always feel like everything's going to be okay. Everything's convenient. Comfort zone. Comfort. Yeah. You know, I know what I'm saying, but I can't get it out right now because I'm thinking about a thousand things at one time. Yeah. But um, I un- I completely understand, like, hearing your story is so motivational because, um, you know, like I said, I, I, I'm just used to watching you on all these movies that I've saw you through in all these uh, different uh, you know, shows and things. You know, Seinfeld. I, I mean, it, it, the list is like, you know, crazy. But to hear that you went through like a whole path and a whole different kind of place and where you got started on your journey of I'm talking to you now where you're writing a book now and you, you got your artwork in the back. I'm like, this guy, he doesn't just sit down, man. He didn't just get <laughs> discovered. You know what I'm saying? You hear a lot of stories a lot of times about, oh, um, how do I get discovered? I'm moving to Los Angeles to get discovered. You have to work, man. It's not a magic. Yeah. Thing. You yeah. have to work to get where you want to be. You have to discover. Well, I'll tell you what. You have to discover yourself. And what I mean by that is you have to discover what people think well, you have to discover what your talent is. See, yeah. the whole, you just hit on something about how I got to be here talking to you with this path. But yeah. the thing was, I knew inside of me that I had something. I believed in that something, totally undefined, uh, but I believed I had something, and I was looking for how to get it out. Now, what I think I found is that really I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a writer. I'm a writer. And it took me that long path of experimentation. But all the time with the joke, Woody Allen, Lenny Bruce, Bill Burr, uh, the Second City, the committee, acting in sitcoms, I always thought, well, if this isn't it, I still got something. In other words, I always had the driver of the force, the inner force. The, uh, so and I, I, my my target to express that drive was always wrong. I, I, wrong is the wrong is the wrong word. But in other words, I said I have something. I bet if I make this funny, I'll see what it is. And I get up on stage for three minutes. Well, I got good enough to open for Woody Allen, but it wasn't what my talent was. Yeah. I'm funny, but where where do you put it? Yeah. Well, this book that I just sold, it's, it's going to come out in, I think, November, uh, January, February, March. March. Okay. And the book that I just sold, it's, a, it's, it's funny. It's a book and it's a memoir and it hits all the points of the 
Stations of the Cross that I pointed out about, you know, genre and agent and bestseller and who you want it to read. But it fills all those pockets and it's still funny and there's funny things in it that I made funny because I know how to be funny. But it's a memoir and it stands and walks by itself because I finally learned enough through all those paths, beginning with the punch in the nose. I said, oh, this is where it was all going, into this book. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a very long process, mine, because I have dyslexia and I'm a slow learner because I have Got dyslexia. And that impedes learning. So I have to learn over and over before I get it. I got it. But you don't. And a lot of people don't. So I'm, they, they, I just expanded the time. It takes me longer to learn than other people. But, yeah. but awesome. still, you have to follow... In other words, you said pick up the pencils because it matters, because it's dangerous to your daughter. But I don't have to pick up my pencils except I forget where I put them. Mm, so, so it does matter. in a different way. Oh, yeah. <laughs> You're telling in a different way, but there's no... The, uh, the uh, unintended consequences aren't as bad. Exactly. I just have to find another yes. pencil. So what, yeah. there, there is a difference. But in other words... All of that stuff finally got me to the place that I've been looking for for a long time. I've always known that there's something I can do better or as good as anybody else in that particular business. I just don't know what it is, but I know I have something. I used to come off the stage of Second City after doing a good set, you know, where people, I I was funny and so was everybody else. The people come up to me after the show and go, oh, you were so funny. And I would walk away from the what the what did i do what do they see that's funny like you see a lot of me you say oh i've been watching you all the time look yeah. there's a lot of actors who have done sort of as um, almost as much i've got i've done a lot of movies but a there's a lot of actors who've done almost as many movies as i have or maybe even more but they don't impinge on your consciousness you remember me you don't remember the other guys as much. I'm not, I'm not bragging. I'm, sa- I'm saying yeah. that's what I tried to figure out. I do have something because you're a kid. I'm on, in, in Home Alone, I'm on for five lines. So you need I'm it. on, I, that's an hour and 15 minute movie, easy. I am on screen for maybe 25 seconds. Mm-hmm. Your kid remembers me. Hey, why, Larry? Let me tell you. Hold up. Wait. wait one second. I, I want to. I want to tell you this. This is awesome. I'm gonna. I'm gonna tell you. You want to know why? This is what's crazy. This might be the fat kid in me, or whatever, or the fat adult, or whatever. The reason why your your part in Home Alone to me was so memorable was because it was placed at a point where you know, and everybody who's seen it, you guys have had to see Home Alone at this point. Um, you know, the mom is calling because she realizes Kevin's not there and you're at the police station and you're eating the donut and you're eating the donut and you're super nonchalant. <laughs> so the scene is the family is rushing to the phone. They just took the lady off the phone because they try to call, get somebody to check on Kevin at the house and you're eating the donut and they're panicking and you on, on in the movie, it's like, yeah, whatever. I'm working on Christmas. I don't care. <laughs> or around Christmas. You know what I'm saying? Like, hey, we got some lady on the line. To the point where, here's the, here's the point right here. This was the point that we laugh, we laugh at still. You're eating the donut. The piece of donut falls on the phone. <laughs> and she's talking. She's, yeah, my son, my son, my son. And you're literally on the phone. And you look and the piece of the donut falls off. And you hear it splat. <laughs> and you're sitting there like, this cop don't give a damn about it. This cop don't give a damn yeah. about her kid. Okay. I've I've watched that several times. Oh, I don't think it's that funny. It's so memorable, yo. Listen, but that's the well, thing. But that's that that's the point. Funny, that's what I'm saying. Man. It's like, funny, you yo. Put it on your kid, but when I watch it, I watch it and I go, what the hell do they think is so fucking funny? It's funny, man. I mean, yes, it is. Yeah, but yeah, see, that's damn. what but, but Woody Allen, no, no, I'll, I'll give you the, 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 the thing. When that happened on the set, 
Um, here's the, the the story behind that. It's kind of interesting. I uh, I I I just had five lines, but I wanted to do it, and they were going to pay me a lot of money because they were they were in a bind. There was a big long story about how I got there, but yeah. they were in a bind. There was an emergency. I was holding out for more money because I didn't know there was an emergency, so they had to pay me. So that's why I was there, because of, of, of the money and the promises, they said. Because I didn't want to do five lines. Who wants to do five lines? Okay. I get there. It took me. They shot that scene 11 times. Those five lines were shot 11 times. Why? There's a major motion picture. They had a lot of money. And every time they shot it, the camera went off the dolly. The camera jiggled, a light exploded, one of the big Krieg lights, it got overheated and showered us with uh, gla glass. They had to stop and clean up the entire set. Some, somebody coughed, somebody laughed, somebody, something dropped, the sound was off, whatever, for 10 times. And I had, I said, they asked me before I went on the show, on the phone, they said, okay, as long as you're going to do it, okay, everything is settled. Do you want any props? Because now that they're paying me all this money and flying me in to Chicago from L.A. and spending all this money and time, they wanted to know, well, does he want anything? You know, they're not doing me a favor because I was wanted money. He said, you want any props? I said, yeah, well, I'm, I'm, I'm supposed to be a cop, right? Mm-hmm. And he goes, they go, yeah, on Christmas. I go, I want to eat a donut, a glazed donut. And he said, that's all you want? I said, yeah, one glazed donut. Because I was getting kind of mad at the fact that they're making such a big deal out of five lines. And I have to go through talking to my agent and talking to them on the phone from Chicago. And what do you want? And blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So I just I didn't, I mean, it was just nerve wracking. So I said, Yes, one donut. And they go, okay, you got it. I say, is that it? And they go, yeah. Okay, we'll see you when you get here. Boom, click. I fly out there, you know, they sent me first class. They got a limo. I mean, it was a, a major thing, five lines. Okay, so I get there, do 10 things. And I say, where's my donut? I, I get on the set. I put in my costume. They have the set all ready for me. I, I say, where's where? I know I'm just trying to be. I'm I'm trying to be funny, but picky, you know. And I I, I didn't Passive. forget. Yeah, 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 yeah I'm yeah, just yeah. trying to give it to him. Like you know, I just. Give it. I say, where's my glazed donut? So the producer says, bring it in. So they run the baker's rolling tray. You know the trays with the rolling trays. Yeah. They're filled with three hundred glazed donuts. And they roll it in. And they say, pick a donut. And I go, ha ha, very funny. I just wanted one. And the producer, to be funny back, said, well, we might have to do a second take. Ha ha, very funny. Okay, so I take my donut, I go in, and boom, 10 times, cut, 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 cut. And each time I had to eat a donut. So now I'm very glad that they tried to make a joke out of it and had yeah, 360 yeah, things. And so did they. And they're all smiling. Ha, ha, ha. Hey, see, see. And on the 11th take, I eat the donut. And it goes through for the first time. No cut in the middle yeah, because yeah. of something happening. All the way through, cut. That's a wrap for Larry. And everybody starts laughing. And I go... What are they laughing about? So Chris Columbus, the director, says, I'll show you. And I said, I don't want to see it. Do we have to do this again? Because uh, I didn't know what happened. I, I was not aware of the donut. So he goes, no, no, I want to show it to you. I said, I don't want to see it. If it's a mistake, let's just do it again. I don't want to see it. He said, I want you to watch this. Come with me. Now, he's the director. So I said, OK. So I go over to the TV village, and they show it. And I'm sitting there, blah, 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 blah. And I see, I'm standing there watching, and I see the donut, the little crumb fall on the phone. Yeah. And everybody watching now laughs. 
And I don't laugh. I see it as a mistake. And I go to Chris, who's standing right next to me. I said, oh, man, okay, let's just see. I told you I didn't want to see my mistakes. Let's just shoot it again. And he says, no, no, we're not shooting this again. This is going in the movie. And I say, why? I dropped the donut on the phone. And he said, Larry, that's called in the business a money shot. That's funny. And I go, it is? And he said, yeah. You're dismissed. Put on your clothes and get out of here. Now he's joking, of course. Yeah, yeah. And I did. And I go, okay. And the movie comes out, and I go to the screening, and it comes my thing, and the thing drops, and the entire audience breaks out laughing. And I go, what the fuck (laughs) is funny? It's funny. Yo, it's hard to say. But, But, Larry, what's funny, man? You know what I mean? Like, funny. I know it's funny. (laughs) I'm saying, I go, Asking people, what do they see? And so it's very good that I'm unconscious of what I do and say is funny. It's better because when I try to be funny, yeah, like get up in front of them and be funny, I can't. It, I get tight. I got I, I, nervous. Yeah, yeah, you're right. You're absolutely right. Listen, I love this. That's I, I, I'm saying that part the most because, like I said, I watch Home Alone every single year, man. But I mean, there's been never- so many. To me and the kids, they say, "Oh, how did you do the donut?" And they come up. There was a green screen. They think it's like a manufactured crazy shit, right? <laughs> joke made in Hollywood. Yeah. No, there's an, an actor, a donut screwed up, and and everybody in the world knows about that donut. And here's what I say to everybody, including yeah. you. It's telling you, man. It's crazy how it's, it's crazy what catches on. That donut crumb is more famous than I am. Yeah. Um, I mean, everybody knows that donut crumb, man. You, you know what else is crazy? Like you were talking about before, about like the genres with book writing and everything like that or whatever. One of the biggest reasons Home Alone is one of the most successful movies in the world. Let's be honest. It is a great movie. Great oh, movie. Goodness. Yes, it's amazing. But, um, but Christmas, man, it's associated with Christmas. Yo, but listen, hey, uh, Mr. Hankin, I, it has been unbelievable how, um, you know, this. I got to go. I've been looking forward to this for uh, the whole week, man. Um, but, uh, you know, shout your book out. What's the title of your book? Oh, it's going to be called, it's called uh, That Guy, because everybody says, oh, you're that guy from Home Alone. They do, for real. They really, well, that guy, period. I mean, Home Alone, Breaking Bad. Money talks. Um, a Billy Madison. Uh, remember, do the laugh. Do the laugh. <laughs> yeah, friends. Yeah, that laugh. Stranger, awesome. State. I mean, uh, friends. Yeah. Seinfeld. I didn't know he was running, and I did that laugh, and he kept it in. Oh, I, really? Because people come up to me and say, "Hey, do that laugh," and I won't do it. I'm oh, embarrassed man. by it. It's funny. Do, do, in, in, in public school, I used to do that in the in the lunchroom. Make, make oh, the, really? So I I did it for for uh, uh, Adam Sandler at lunchtime. He said, "I hear you do this funny laugh." So I said, "I'm not going to do it in the movie." He said, "No, no, no, but do the funny laugh." So I did it. And he said, "Oh, that's funny." I said, "No, it's not." And then when we were shooting, he said, "Do that funny laugh," and I thought, "Oh, we're on camera," and you know the the acting thing just got into me. Oh, it's being a film; it's important. Yeah. So I. It, figuring well I won't do it the next take and Adam said moving on because it was his film but because he knew I wouldn't do it again because I told him at lunchtime I said I'm not doing it in the movie <laughs> I'm glad I'm glad he did it sucks he, it sucks he tricked you but I, <laughs> hey, I want to ask you one more thing actually Mr. Hank if you don't mind so who who in the industry I mean you've done so much man but Who's in the industry have been like some people are you like, man, I'm, I'm, I can't believe I worked with them. You, have you ever been like kind of starstruck or or just like really gotten a chance to talk to uh, somebody you wanted to? Um, I mean, there's only two people who I recall, really. One, because I knew he was a great actor and I wanted to work with him. And that's Brian Cranston on Breaking Bad. I knew I was going to be working with Brian Cranston. That's, I love Brian Cranston. I was on the A game and uh, I fucked up a little. Uh, I, I went up on my lines. He doesn't want you to go up on your lines, not even once. And I asked the director, I went up, I said, hey, did I do something wrong? He said, well, what do you think you did wrong? I said, I went up on my lines. And Brian said, hey, man, remember your lines. 
and he said it not happily. Good. And I to the director, I said, you know, I went up on my lines. And the director said, he whispered it to me. The director said, well, number one, Larry, all actors go up on their lines. And two, fuck Branston. We're, we're, fuck Cranston. We're losing the light. Get back in there and let's finish the scene. <laughs> so that was kind of kind of him, the, the director, to calm me down. Don't yeah, worry. Make you feel better. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Make me feel better. Got so, it. yeah. Uh, and then uh, uh, the, the second one is a Clint Eastwood. But no, I wasn't. You know, I wanted to meet him because he, at the time, he was one of the most famous actors in the world. Yeah, of all time, man. People forget that. But now Rock is, and I worked with The Rock, too. That's my but, guy, but, man. But when I worked with Clint Eastwood, I, was, I wasn't filled with the awe and the tenseness of working with Brian Cranston. With, with Clint, I just looked up to him as, a, as an experienced actor who makes a lot of movies and he's really famous but once i got to know him um i just looked up to him as a teacher just a favorite teacher and i just hung around with him i followed him around i i wouldn't let him out of my sight i just uh, because there was a reason as an actor i wanted to not be in awe of him or look at him as a teacher on screen so i wanted to be around as much as possible to just get used to being with him. Mm. So when I got on screen, I could just be that normal Charlie Butts. And, and yeah, yeah. You know, so it was an actor's thing, but um, with Brian, I couldn't get rid of it. I mean, I, I just looked and oh, I was, a, I was a scared. I was, I, I was afraid to be, I was afraid of fucking up. And so therefore you fuck up, you know. That's what happens, right? As I, said, I can't not do much with it. You actually just made me think of that, man. Like it, it, it's got to be crazy for somebody who's, um, you know, trying to, you know, work. Like you said, it's, it's still work. Like, you know, it's, it, but, but to be around somebody who you're kind of inspired by or just really like, you know, admire or whatever, but you have to, you know, kind of leave, let that go when you're acting. You have to kind of forget about that and, you know, yeah, your yeah. role, man. So most of the time you can do it. And some of the times you, you know, you just, man, I remember one time, I, this is the last thing. I, I really got to cool. go. That's cool. Yeah. That's Pretty cool. Um, I was working with a camera, a Garner, Gar, Gar, Garner, uh, Garner. Gardner or Garner. He used to be doing a black and white TV shows. Uh, Garner. You know, but anyway. He was a big star. He was a big star. And I, I thought of him as a big star. You know, he was like kind of like Brian, uh, in between Brian Cranston and Clint Eastwood, sort of in there, you know, star, but okay. So I'm doing a scene with him. It was just me and him and we're talking. And he's talking, he's saying his line to me, blah, blah, blah. And it's, you know, camera's rolling. We're seeing, we're, we're shooting it. Blah, blah, blah. I'm talking. And then he says something. Now he's got this long speech. Blah, 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 blah. In the middle of his speech, I don't blah blah, and he goes, blah, 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 and he just stops in the middle and he walks off the stage. He walks out of the scene behind the camera, and nobody says anything. And he, he just walks out in the walks out in the middle of the scene, and I'm left there alone, and nobody says anything. It's quiet, and then he he, he just very slowly walks back, calmly, walks back, and he says, "Okay, uh, let's go again." And we, we did it again. So after, and he just goes through it, the whole thing. Okay, so afterwards, I asked him, I said, now, what was that all about? We were in the middle of the scene, everything was fine, and you just stopped talking and you just walked away. What did you do? Well, nobody said anything. Well, what was going on? So he said, well, you know, there, with everybody who's making this movie, well, the only thing that counts is time is money. So if they can cut corners, they'll do it. So if I, if I go through a scene and I'm awful, but I get through the scene, they're going to use it because time is money and they don't want to shoot it again because I'm awful. So if I feel that I'm awful, i got to walk out of the scene and stop it before it's finished or they're going to use it. So I make sure I get out of the scene so they can't use it because they didn't finish it. And then I'll come back and I'll do it again better. And if I like it, I'll keep on going and then they can use it and they don't have to shoot it again. Mm -hmm. So I thought 
oh, that's a good thing I just learned from a teacher. How to say the scene if you're not feeling right. Yeah. So the next TV sitcom I did, that's what I did. I'm with a star, and the scene is going blah, 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 blah. And in the middle of the scene, I feel I'm not doing my best. So I walked out of the scene and around the camera. And like the shit hit the fan, man. I mean, I just like, what the fuck are you doing, man? <laughs> I said, well, I'm walking out of the scene because I didn't feel good. You didn't feel good? What the fuck, man? What do you think you are? I mean, so you got to pick your shots. And yeah, 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 for sure. I mean, it's good if you're a star, you can do that. If you're just an actor. <laughs> I got you. So again, I don't think any unintended consequences. I just, oh, yeah, well, you can walk out of the scene anytime you want. Cool. No. Well, no. man. I got to get out of here, man. It, yeah, it's been it's been great. Thank you so much, man. I I, I can't believe I came to this experience. Like you definitely motivated. You had a lot of very inspirational talk, man. The reason I like talking to you, man, this is a great show. Is Thank you, you. To talk about the things that people don't talk about. About mm. how movies are really made, man. It's not like what you see at all. Yeah, and man. Life is a good image of that. So I like awesome. to these, but people don't let me talk about. The fuck ups and the and the and the I weird. love it. I yeah. love it, man. I love it. Yeah. Because in all businesses, there's the smooth running and there's the uh, you know, we gotta fix this. Okay. For sure. I gotta get out of here, man. I got an appointment. Thank Maybe. you, Larry. Thank you so much, man. Thank you okay. guys for watching. Good luck. Great show. Check out his books, guys. Love you. Have you on anytime, man. Have a great time. Thank you so much for coming on today, Larry. Stay true. Stay positive. Pay attention.